Without further ado, I'd just like to uh, again welcome everybody to um, this panel discussion. And I emphasise panel because I'd like, <clears throat> and the aim of the exercise is to have a discussion around carbon, um, carbon legislation that is being proposed by the government. Um, I would prefer that people did not, um, um, I, <clears throat> I guess it's finding out the ins and outs of, of uh, what's being proposed rather than people making uh, statements about whether they believe in climate change or not. So that's basically off the table. <laughs> so, um, and it's my, it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce the panel to you. Our, speak, our first speaker is John Morrow, who's the Chief Sustainability Officer with Auckland Council. Um, and then doc, uh, he'll be followed by Dr. Amelia Sharman, who is uh, with the um, Interim Climate Change Committee. She's on cons uh, secondment from the Productivity Commission. And then Amel uh, John Carnegie will follow um, Amelia. And John is the Executive Director of uh, Business New Zealand Energy Council. Uh, and uh, I should just like to acknowledge the um, support that the um, New Zealand Business Energy Council has afforded the Energy Centre to do the modelling work looking at uh, New Zealand's energy futures. Um, so that's a very exciting project that we have with the um, <coughs> New Zealand Energy Council. And then the last speaker is uh, Professor Caroline Saunders, uh, who is incredibly well known uh, as a academic uh, in New Zealand. Caroline is based at Lincoln University, and I understand she's just uh, launched a book on well-being. Is that right, Caroline? And she's probably got flyers there. <laughs> it's free, so there you go. The price is right. Okay, so as you know, as I understand it, um, the Zero Carbon Bill is currently being drafted, and my understanding is that was to occur, or is to occur, over July, December of this year, and then it'll go to select committee uh, at the beginning uh, of the new year. So, <clears throat> with that in mind, I'd just like to ask John to, uh, to lead off the, the presentation, and we're going to ask each speaker to speak for 10 minutes, and then at the end, after Caroline, we'll have a question and answer session. So, John, welcome. Great. Tēnā koto katoa, ko John Moro Tako Ngoa, uh, no America aho, ke Ponsonby e noho ana, ko uh, Toku Turanga he Chief Sustainability Officer te uh, Kaunihera o Tamaki Makoto aho, no reira tēnā koto katoa. Um, thank you for the opportunity to be up here. My name is John Moro, as you were told, and um, I've got 10 minutes to whip you through. The clicker's there. Um, a quick presentation about three things. That's the end. That's pretty quick. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> so I, I, I'm clearly, I just wanted to, um, there we go, excellent. Hey. Great. Look, pretty pictures, here we go. So three quick things. One, a, a few basics about the Zero Carbon Bill, um, which we can probably cover off in two slides, and I'm guessing this is a relatively informed audience. Um, the second thing is just, you know, of course, I'm from council, I wanna tell you all the great stuff we're doing. Um, but I do have a confession in there too, as I've said to a few um, over wine. Um, and then also what we're really up against and how we really need to reposition ourselves to think about the future. Those are the three things I'll cover in now about eight and a half minutes. But let's be really clear. How many people besides Russell Bailey came here to see this guy instead of me? Um, I'm really sorry. Um, and I can't speak on behalf um, of the Green Party, um, but I can actually say from um, a council who's quite involved with central government and actually working and have, have a signed agreement with how we're working together on climate change, talk a little bit about what we're doing in this space and a little bit about government, obviously not from somebody from central government. Um, this is what I presented to councillors and the mayor when we tried to get our zero carbon bill submission across the line, which was successfully voted for. And this, I'll show you what our actual position is in the next slide. But for those who are coming up to speed on what the zero carbon bill is, which I imagine is probably no one, um, you know, really what this does is set the policy architecture for the future. It's not a quick fix. It's actually what can we do now 
to, to transition to a low carbon and resilient society over the course of several decades. That's what this is about. It provides stability and transparency across all sectors. And it actually does quite a bit to, to try to generate pathways for innovation um, so that we don't leave businesses or people behind. Um, the specifics, as those who are well read in the, uh, this is almost painful to see me condense it to just a few words, but it sets targets and budgets um, that align with those targets. Um, it creates a new independent commission, which I believe my colleague might speak a little bit about. Um, and then it considers climate change adaptation as part of the package, which is actually later at minute nine, one of my takeaway messages from what we're doing. These are the six key points we made to committee, and they bought it, and they, they endorsed it, um, and that's what we sent off to the, uh, to the Ministry for the Environment. Um, I won't go into every detail here, but I, I have a suspicion we might get talking about what it means to set a, a target of net zero across all gases. That could be a feisty one, because um, it's contestable. Um, the rest of it isn't terribly contestable, but um, maybe it is from the audience, so we'll, we can go there. Now, the other thing I wanted to do is just take you very briefly through some of the things we're doing as council. Um, but of course, I'm going to end with a bit of a confession. Um, and I'm going to give you five quick examples of an obvious problem that has something to do with climate change, and then a bit of value add, something that we've done a slight bit differently um, to get a better, a, a better outcome. The first one is actually in our waste, um, and, and to acknowledge the folks in, in the waste team, and actually to acknowledge the staff here from Auckland Council. I've, I've seen Sophie Hayway, I think Alec Tang from my team might be here, maybe Sarah Anderson. Um, there's some great people at Council doing innovative work in the space of waste and actually a lot of other things. And instead of saying, how do we just get the waste done, we actually created um, community recycling centers that empower the community, um, almost decentralized power to, to individuals creating jobs and actually diverting something like 62% of waste to landfill at some of these centers. So it's a bit of a new way of doing business in the waste space. You could look at flooding and infrastructure as an issue and say, well, let's just put in a bigger pipe when we've got a problem with flooding. Um, instead, um, the Healthy Waters team went in and actually created training for uh, the workforce there, uh, a collaborative tree planting nursery with a school and a local trust and actually added transport choice to the mix, actually did what the community wanted in that space. And instead of it being a how to keep flooding at bay project, it became a project people are increasingly excited about. The other problem around car dependence, um, you know, wow, we, we have a problem with choice, I'd still say, um, and a problem with safety, which has been hitting the newspapers lately. Um, well, what can we do to va add value here? We could actually invest. We could invest $200 million in cycleways over the course of the last three years with some central government funding. There's my pitch for Gareth and the in, um, government. Um, and it's about placemaking and creating choice that we currently don't have. I mean, I rode my bike here and had to look over my shoulder at every corner. So this is a re very real thing uh, for Auckland right now. Same thing with the city being dead by 501. Um, you know, that's when I first came to New Zealand about 20 years ago, not to live here, but to travel. Um, I noticed that the city sort of died a very quick death after the workday. Um, instead, now you're seeing increasingly a city that's built for families, a city that's built for fun, and that's actually facilitating activation of space, like here in Silo Park. And then the last example I'll give you is around funding. And we were talking a bit about this earlier. Um, you know, how do you align the funding streams to what outcomes you actually want out of that funding? We've done that recently with targeted rates, which thank you for those who are paying targeted rates to Auckland Council to actually deliver outcomes like water quality. Um, we've also done this, this with the issue of New Zealand's first green bond on the domestic market. Um, $200 million that's financing and refinancing our electric train fleet. Um, and that's a bit of a first, kind of pushing out the boat a little bit to say, look, the investment community is looking for a different set of outcomes around well-being. And this is one of those tools that we've used to get there. Okay, so I've given you my five examples. Um, my confession, we are not doing enough, and we are not doing it fast enough, full stop. So what's at stake? Um, obviously, we've got issues like, ooh, I have animations that I didn't know about. Um, issues like rising emissions. Um, here's the reality. Our emissions continue to tick upward. Per capita, they're starting to decouple. They still go upward over time when our stated goal is to come down. Now, we've got GDP growth. We've got population growth. But other cities are cracking that and delivering zero, car well, more uh, car low carbon uh, solutions with rising populations and GDP. So we can too. We're also seeing tremendous risks of climate impacts and actually seeing them today in Auckland. 
Um, and I'll get into that in a second. So on the emissions side, for those who need a kind of primer on what our emission sources are, really it's transport and industry um, in Auckland. It's not agriculture like is the case for the national conversation, which makes us a bit different as the largest local authority or regional authority. Um, and then the impact side, you'll see that, you know, no surprises here. You know, the sea's going to go up, it's going to get hotter, the rain is going to get more intense, and drought conditions and too wet will actually happen at the same time. Um, we're getting smarter about where this is going to happen and what it looks like between now and 2110. We've done that work, and so we could actually inform better decisions around infrastructure and policymaking. Um, there's, you probably can't read this one, it's all right, but um, th there are some real issues that will actually result in some of these changes to the climate here regionally in Auckland, and of course, there would be some site-specific issues too. Everything from issues around coastal erosion to invasive species to reduced infrastructure resilience. So this is a real thing. We look forward to the Auckland of not just 30 years from now, but actually the Auckland of three years from now. And how many 500-year you know, floods are we going to feel in the next five years? It's a really serious issue for us now. So um, I think I'm just about there. Solutions and what's at stake and how are we going to move forward? Really, not to be too alliterative here, um, but we need to integrate and innovate. Um, there's a reason why there's this kind of cheesy Venn diagram about how you do adaptation and mitigation at the same time, because you deliver a whole suite of benefits if you do that. And taking away reducing emissions and actually becoming climate resilient, if we're really speaking to those maybe outside this room and those who really need to care about this issue, we're talking about human health, we're talking about social cohesion, we're talking about long-term economic productivity. Those are the things that a, a real strong push toward climate action will actually get us in the long-term future. The other things, of course, we need to involve. We're council. We want to hear from you, and we want to work with you to evolve our plan. Um, and we need to invest, like I said, in the green bond issue. We actually need to invest in these solutions to actually make it move forward. So here's where I do my shameless pitch. I might get another chance to do it when I'm on the panel. But we, it's, it's, it's small potatoes because we've got lots of work streams in the area right now of developing our climate action plan. But one of those things you could actually log on as you're in this room, if you so choose, um, is to climateakl.nz. It's a crowdsourced ideas platform that we've just ginned up that says, right, what are your solutions for how to become climate resilient and low carbon? The best ideas will be fed into an expert panel. The best ideas will be iterated over time. And we'll actually feed them into our climate plan. So you can be involved right now from your seat, if you so choose. I think. Oh, and of course, all sorts of other engagement, including youth events that we've been doing around this work. We, I think we've had four separate youth events um, just in the last couple months in this space and a whole host of other activity. Is David Hall here as well? I think he was on the RSVP list. I don't think he's here. He's a member of our independent advisory group that we have from kind of our mini climate commission. Um, so there's a whole range of things we're doing right now to develop our plan for Auckland. But I think that's all the time I have. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, my name is Amelia. I'm currently at the Interim Climate Change Committee, which I'm not going to talk about in my presentation, but you can ask me questions about in the panel. Um, I am going to talk about the New Zealand's trans transition to a low emissions economy. So <clears throat> for those who don't know what the Productivity Commission is, we're an independent Crown entity. We have three commissioners and a staff of about 20 people, 15, 20 people. And we get given terms of reference by the government on thorny public policy issues that they want us to look at, really, and have a really good look at. We do a lot of work on housing. Uh, um, we did some on tertiary education, which might be of interest to people in this room. And then we got given the low emissions economy inquiry by the previous government. And so what happens in an inquiry? So we get given a terms of reference by the government. We write, take uh, about six weeks to write an issues paper and we put out loads and loads of questions and we want submissions from you on the answers to those questions. This inquiry, we got more submissions than we have ever had ever. Uh, one of our other inquiries got 12. So four, over 400 was huge for us. Um, and then what we do is we go away, produce a draft report which has you know, answers to most of our questions but still some questions and then a final report. This inquiry was the first time we'd had a change of, a big change of government. The new government said, hey, keep going, but think about not just a low emissions economy, but a net zero uh, New Zealand. So I'll explain how we did that um, in the future or later on. 
So we had lots of in submissions, we attended lots of events. We were really interested in the UK Climate Change Act. We um, went over there and wrote a note about how that works. We had loads and loads of engagement meetings. We did a couple of bits of uh, expert modelling. So one was on the electricity sector. The electricity sector is absolutely central to the transition. And then we also did some wider modelling, which incorporated land use and energy and this idea of uncertainty. What do you do in the future when the future is uncertain? So I'll talk about that as well. And then, as I said, final report in August. It is, I'm sorry, over 600 pages. You don't have to read all of that. There's a two minute video, which you can watch. Um, there's also every chapter, there's 17 chapters. Every chapter has a one page summary. So you can read the whole report in 17 pages. So to achieve a low emissions economy, we need stable and credible climate policy. This is, sounds a bit banal, but it is absolutely vital. You need to set in place policy that endures over time, that people believe is going to last, so that they can make good investment decisions. And this is individuals making good investment decisions, business making good investment decisions, and you know, your wider civil society. So what does this mean really in practice? So there's four pillars that we identified under stable and credible climate policy. Firstly, we need to do better emissions pricing. We need to reform the ETS as it currently stands. So it's a cap and trade scheme with no cap. So we recommended that there absolutely needs to be a cap. We also recommended a separate emissions pricing scheme for, for biogenic methane. So that's methane from waste and from agriculture. We proposed that that could either take the form of a dual cap uh, New Zealand emissions trading scheme or a methane quota system. So really similar to the fisheries individual, individual transferable quota system. And I'm really happy to take questions on that. Uh, second, legislation institutions. We need new law, so fantastic. A zero carbon bill, exactly what we recommended. Um, so that is, as John said, a series of emissions budgets that ramp up, you know, that over time get you to your goal. <laughs> that you have really strong um, capability within central government to make good plans. And then also you have an independent climate change commission who can recommend, but not decide on the emissions budgets and what you know, some of the work should be done. Complementary regulations and policies. Pricing is really important. It sends a really strong signal, but it's not going to get you all the way. There are lots of places across the economy where emissions pricing is not going to be the answer. So we recommend all sorts of things that need to happen across the economy to support the emissions price. Uh, you might have heard of our recommendation for a fee bait. So that's for electric vehicles. So when you're importing electric vehicles, if you're importing vehicles over a certain emission standards, you pay a fee. If you import them under a certain emission standards, you get a rebate. It's fiscally neutral. It is regressive, however. So therefore, we also recommend a scrappage policy for those on low incomes to help them move towards electric vehicles. Because as John pointed out, transport is one of our big problems and we really need to ramp up um, the uptake of EVs. And then we've got lots and lots of other complementary policies around in waste and other sectors. And then finally, emission, uh, investment and innovation. Innovation is vital. If we don't have innovation, it's not good. the whole thing is not going to work. The whole point of emissions pricing is that innovation eventually takes over. It forces people to do the exciting work that means you don't need to pay an emissions price. Investment, there's enough capital out there to achieve a low emissions future. It's just about redirecting that investment into low emitting activities versus high emitting activities. We recommend lots of things um, around investment, one of which is mandatory climate related disclosures for large organisations. So you're having to talk about what it is in your organisation, um, what the risk is to your business. That's really important for two reasons. A, it helps investors decide across comparable opportunities which is the low emissions option so they can reduce their risk. And also it helps the business themselves look internally and say, hey, hey how can we be more resilient? How can we manage our climate risk? The zero carbon bill, as I said, we recommended this first. Not, not our idea, really. Um, but yeah, emissions budgets, absolutely central. Um, I don't think people really realise how much of a core economic policy emissions budgets are. But one, if you have a target and your emissions budgets you know, are set to that target, it really is going to drive a lot of investment. Uh, and yeah, as I said, I'm on the interim committee. I'm not working on the zero carbon bill. We're, we're trying to have a you know, firewall between us. But you know, if people have questions, I can hopefully, hopefully tell you what I know about what's going on there. And then yes, short and long-lived gases, one of my favourite subjects. 
So New Zealand is really, really unusual, and I don't think some people realise how unusual we are. Most other developed economies have most of their emissions are CO2, which is long lived. There is no debate, there's no question that CO2 needs to get to net zero or negative to stop warming. It just absolutely has to. That any additional CO2 going into the atmosphere is going to contribute to warming. However, short lived gases, and that's mostly biogenic methane, but it's some HFCs, they don't have to get to net zero to stop warming. This is because the short lived gas, basically, the steady state, if you, if, if you think about the bathtub being two degrees and you don't want the level of the water to overflow, you've got to stop your long-lived gas inflow, but you can have a steady inflow and outflow of short-lived gases. This does not mean that the current level of short-lived gases is sustainable. There has to be substantial and sustained emissions reductions of short-lived gases. But the key message we really, you know, we found throughout the inquiry, they do not get, need to get to net zero to stop warming, and that is the key goal. So we recommend separate uh, targets for long and short-lived gases in the zero carbon bill, where there is a net zero target by a specified date, say 2050, whereas your sh short-lived gas target is recommended on advice of the Climate Change Commission, and then that is set in delegated legislation, because the key thing there is that target level is likely to change over time. We don't know now, in 2018, what the right sustained level of methane is going to be to stop to you know limit warming to two degrees. So we need some kind of flexibility in the system to allow for that. We hopefully I've got time. We so as I said we did modeling, we did modeling to net zero, we did modeling to twenty um, to a twenty five megaton, so a low emissions future. We also did some really interesting modeling around uncertainty. So most modeling is is what's called perfect foresight modeling. You know what's going to happen out to the future. We don't know what's going to happen out to the future with technology. So what we did was we did some really cool, nifty stuff with Motu, um, Concept and Vivid, our modelers. And what we found was that in any state of the world, no matter what technology comes along, we will be better off in a future where there are higher emissions prices early. So by early, I mean up until 2030. So if we have stricter emissions budgets, which inevitably lead to higher emissions prices in the early stages, the overall transition to net zero is going to be less costly. The reasons why that is, is because it helps to avoid lock-in of high emitting assets, you know, decisions that are being made now about things like boilers and whatnot. And then also it spurs innovation. As I said before, innovation is critical. We absolutely need technology to help us with this challenge. So the more that we can spur that on, the better. And the modelling showed us that there are some key changes that need to occur. We need to replace fossil fuels and we need to replace them with electricity, low emissions electricity across the economy. That's things like EVs, that's in process heat. It really is about saying we've got to stop burning fossil fuels and how can we make that happen? And then secondly, we've got to change land use, and there's two aspects to that. Firstly, the modelling showed us, and this is just modelling, I want to caveat, that the, that the lowest cost way to achieve most of our emissions reductions targets is afforestation. So planting lots and lots and lots of trees. That's, our modelling showed us 1.8 to 2.3 million hectares of trees. To put that in context, a billion trees is only half a million hectares. So in this modelling, it showed things like 20% of Gisborne would be afforested. If that is actually going to happen, we need to really seriously consider if that's the right future for New Zealand. But that's what the modelling at the moment is telling us is the lowest cost way to achieve our targets. And interestingly, that is mostly from marginal sheep and beef land. It's not from dairy. It's from land that is currently marginally profitable in its current form. And then secondly, we need to change the structure and methods of agricultural production. We need to be much more efficient. We need to be much better at taking up agricultural innovation. And that's it. Please go and watch the video, read the report, and ask me any questions. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm John Carnegie. I'm the Executive Director of the Business New Zealand Energy Council, um, and I'm Head of Climate Change Policy at uh, Business New Zealand, um, which is New Zealand's peak business advocacy organisation. 
Um, actually, I'm going to take a slightly different um, view and actually dovetails quite nicely with, with what we've already heard um, in terms of rather than speaking about specific solutions, which of course there are numerous, um, I'm going to talk a bit more about how business in general thinks about zero carbon bill and how we should approach things. Um, and then we'll have, we can have a, a richer conversation hopefully um, after that. Um, now, John started with a um, confession. Actually, I, I have... I have an admission. Um, and so I thought, I'd, you know, straight off the bat, I'd start with an admission of, of sorts. Um, and that's that I don't know the future. Um, now, actually, it's amazing the number of people actually that do, or at least admit to doing. Um, so I'm sorry to disappoint you. Um, now, actually, that might seem a bit trite um, in terms of the fact that actually none of us really do, right? Um, and in fact, with the rate of technological change that we're observing, um, no one does, though, again, you might be forgiven for thinking that some, some do. Because um, from our perspective, actually, the future has got, if anything, harder to predict, um, not easier. Um, even if we think, actually, that the problem we're solving has become clearer, which, of course, in this case, it absolutely has. And this last bit's actually quite, quite important. I did say that the problem we are solving, that's climate change, actually has got clearer and, in fact, more pressing. Um, so, you know, I hope you weren't expecting a business type bloke to get up here and rail against climate change because that's not what I'm going to do. Um, but, you know, I guess the question that I'm posing is, you know, even if we know the direction we need to head in, you know, how do we know what New Zealand society and the economy might evolve to look like um, in 2050? And the Productivity Commission did some great work um, with respect to this. But you know, even below, beyond, you know, 2060, 2070, you know, and how do we know what we do now will get us there in a way that can actually retain our high standards of living and actually that we have a prosperous, uh, thriving economy? Um, and as I said, it's you know, essentially, you know, we get smart people all the time actually consistently and organisations consistently failing um, to anticipate future trends and disruptions, and it is because the future is unknowable, even if the trends are clear enough. Um, but I guess my point is actually, with care, we can create our future, right? Um, but it's executing a course of action to a so-called end point that's fraught with difficulty, because there are no easy or straightforward solutions to wicked and complex problems. Um, and in fact, if anyone who has one of these, they're probably selling snake oil. Um, so look, why am I belabouring this point? Actually. It most certainly isn't a prescription for an action, it's just a plea for carefully considered policies. Um, and I guess the point is that if we don't have these, this is what we get. <laughs> <laughs> and I hate to say it, there's actually a hell of a lot of this going around. Um, and this is what the Business New Zealand Energy Council and Business New Zealand in general are trying to avoid. You know, stories about the future that actually require massive leaps in faith about things that might happen. Um, so this is the sphere where we get stories based around us all driving electric cars by 2020 um, and us solving our climate change uh, challenge by a methane injection for cows, um, or worse, by our major energy intensive uh, industry closing, um, which I have to say was um, associated with some of the work that the Productivity Commission um, put out. Um, so in fact, that might by its very nature, tend us towards the con conservative end of the spectrum, but it's actually important to make sure that the stories that we're collectively telling are credible and plausible, not incredible and implausible. Um, and so I, I guess actually here's, a, here's another omission of sorts. Um, I absolutely hate this word. Um, and you actually often hear it bandied about as something that we need, or in fact that business um, wants, um, especially, actually, in the context of our emission reduction target. Um, certainty, you know, if only we have it, it'll get us to where we need to get to, right? Well, actually, in my book, you know, if someone's asking for certainty, all it does is it implies that someone who wants, someone wants someone who is less well-placed to handle um, the risk um, to wear it. Um, and unfortunately, in our context, it's usually the government that ends up bearing the risk um, you know, government full of very smart, well-meaning people, but if anyone's going to lose their shirt, it'll be the taxpayers. Um, but what, so what business actually really wants, and in fact we've already heard, heard of this, you know, they want 
They want a policy um, and framework predictability and stability. Um, you know, they want political durability. So they want to know what the rules of the game are. They don't want to be told how to play it, basically. Um, you know, because in telling someone, telling business how to play the game, actually what you're doing is hardwiring innovation out of the system rather than into it. Um, and so what are we doing to help business and policy makers make good decisions about our future, having just told you all that we don't know what the future is? Well, what we're doing is we're leading a cross-sector, so that's public and private uh, sector initiative to develop whole of energy sector scenarios, and Basil uh, kindly referred to that at the outset. Um, and so also we're collaborat collaborating, as also mentioned uh, by Basil with Auckland University and in fact the Energy Centre, for which actually I'm incredibly thankful for the foresight of both Basil Sharp and, and Goldborn, thank you Goldborn, um, for their leadership, and um, Kitty uh, Suleimanen, um, for who I see sitting in the back, for her, well, let me call it a leap of courage, um, or faith perhaps in committing to put in the hard yards on our ambitious little project, so thank you Kitty. Um, and here are the folk that are involved in the work that we're doing, and so you can essentially see it's a who's who of the, the energy sector. Um, and we are incredibly proud of the work that we're doing, and um, our refresh will see the light of day in the next six months um, sometime. Um, so in terms of climate change policy developments, you, you, uh, hopefully you'll know all of this. I guess the, there's a lot going on. Actually, that's, that's a hell of an understatement. Um, what we actually have now is incredib an incredibly crowded policy and institutional landscape. Um, so, you know, one of the key things, actually, I think, going forward from a business perspective is um, how it all fits together. Um, so how do we transition smoothly to a low greenhouse gas economy and deliver economic growth? You know, there are some big questions, actually, as an economy and a society that we need to get our heads around. Um, and again, one of the things that was mentioned earlier um, is often the regressive nature of some of the changes. You know, we, the key thing that we learned from the 80s is that the pace and distribution of transition is often uneven. Um, so, you know, we need to be incredibly cautious um, about that. But whatever actually we do needs to work for New Zealand and our circumstances. And again, hopefully you all know all of, all of this, right? So here are some of these circumstances. Um, you know, we are incredibly well placed as, as a country and a society. Um, you know, especially actually when we look at some of the other countries who are trying to lift their renewable emission targets to say 15 or 20 per cent. Um, and here, um, again, I mean, it's just a nice picture of showing you the nature of the, the targets. I possibly perhaps politely use the word ambitious. Um, you know, because there are a number of options on the, on the table. Um, I guess the key thing from our perspective is that and from a business perspective is actually the precise nature of the target matters a lot to business. For business, that's the beacon on the hill. Um, it'll be that that will help shape the investment intentions for the business community. Um, so, you know, you want to, uh, the key point there is about ca needing to calibrate um, policies and actions to achieve the target. I mean, and, and it's quite easy to roll off the tongue, a net target. Well. I actually have no idea what that is, right? I've no idea what the net bit of our target might be. Um, so they're actually, you know, again, it's, it's quite straightforward to say, well, it'll be a, a net zero by a certain date, but that actually might mean just planting a whole lot of trees, right? Actually, that's not really the transition that as a country we need. Maybe in the short term, but certainly not in the long term. Actually, what we need to do is be bending our growth curve downwards, and, you know, we have to a very small extent started to do that. I think and, um, over the last couple of years there's been a 2% reduction in gross emissions. So you can just start to, to see the, the fresh um, shoots, hopefully, of a change in the nature of our um, economy. I mean, I guess the key thing from this for a business is that business sector is that the business sector is actually an equal measure, both excited by the opportunity, but also um, feeling, um, has a feeling of trepidation um, especially if you're in the emitting trade exposed sector. Um, so there's a need for a lot of conversations to continue over the next uh, several months 
um, as I said, not least of which will be around the nature of the targets. Um, so access to international units is one of the things that's been talked about, linking to other schemes, you know, how to calibrate stringency of action across jurisdictions, um, how to unlock finance and risk sharing tools. Now, you know, again, they're incredibly easy to say, but they're com incredibly complex um, things to solve at an economy-wide um, level. So how to boost innovation. Um, you know, all of the, the aforementioned relationship to our, um, our NDC as, a, as, a, um, as an economy-wide target. Um, and also, well, we've got an ETS, just what that means in terms of the range of other policies that we might want to um, implement, both at the city level as well as um, nationally. Um, actually, but though one of the things I do want to do um, is acknowledge the work of the, well, actually, I guess now he's, he's not so freshly minted, um, no, that was a bad pun, uh, the Green Party Minister of um, Climate Change, the Honourable James Shaw, um, who has been working hellishly hard um, to build bridges to the business community and, in fact, to the agricultural sector. Um, and actually now, importantly, to the now opposition party in an effort to create a long-term durable framework. Um, all I can say is that's in stark, stark contrast to what's happening in other jurisdictions. You just have to look across the, the ditch to get a sense of that, right? So, you know, it's, we're, um, you know, climate change policy in Australia is a bit of a blood sport, right? Um, but it, 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 seems to be, it seems to be less so here, thank goodness. Um, and so when you're talking about ambition, actually, this is where it ends up, right? So, you know, this is the, this is the, car, the carbon price and how it's tracked up to... Well, actually, it's hovering around the $25 fixed price option um, level. Um, the question, of course, is, and again, you know, if, again, if we think we all know the future, the question is, you know, where will it go to next? Well, you know, I imagine if I asked you all, most of you would say it's going to go up, right? Well, you know, it might. Um, but, you know, we've just seen quite a major correction in the carbon price in Europe, so who knows what's going to happen to this price? And that'll actually be a function of how stringent, the, the cap, well, where we've set with a cap, sorry, with a budget, oh, sorry, where we get to with a target, and then how we set the, um, the budgets. Um, and then also, actually, whether we retain a price cap, because, of course, we all know you can only control one thing, right, quantity or price. So if you have a price cap, actually, you may not get to an ambitious target, but who knows. So, look, um, in terms of business, look, we see both risks and opportunities. Um, there's certainly more awareness of the, the window of opportunity now because it just makes good sense for business, certainly good for um, the New Zealand Inc brand. And also, you know, business sees that the low carbon economy actually it doesn't just equal, and in fact this is more widely acknowledged now in the public sector and the work that it's doing, that it doesn't just acknowledge, it doesn't just equate to um, the emissions trading scheme alone. Carbon pricing is an important part, but it is just a part of the sustainable business story. Um, so the business challenge actually is adjusting to an increasingly um, emissions constraint. Actually, I've deliberately used the word emissions there, right, because we're here on a panel talking about zero carbon. Actually, it could be zero emissions, right? So, um, you know, we're in an increasingly emissions-constrained and priced world, and the key challenge for businesses, particularly those who trade across borders, are these two things. How to stay internationally competitive um, and how to avoid investment and carbon leakage in the face of real uncertainty about what others are doing and the asymmetric impl um, uh, implementation of climate change policies across countries. But of course, there are the leaders who see the challenge and want to run at it. Um, and my friend here, John, and his, his council is one of those leaders. Um, so congratulations, John, that's, fan that's fantastic. Um, and I imagine undoubted, there are undoubtedly other organisations with representatives here um, in the audience who belong to this coalition. Uh, well, well done. I mean, it's business doing what they do best, right? Le leading, um, not actually waiting for government to give them the answer. Um, so, what business wants? They want to be the, they'll be the key solution provider, um, because ultimately it'll be the business community that will deliver on whatever the target is. Um, and so what we're striving for, and in fact, I, I'm delighted to say what we increasingly have with government is a more mature conversation about the nature of the targets and what it, what it means across the business community, right? Because there's no, you know, there's no single representative business. There are businesses right across the spectrum, from the, your heavy emitting 
energy intensive right through to your service based um, organisations for whom the task is somewhat easier. Um, and you know, going back to the previous point, we want a more predictable environment and hopefully a clear goal. So it'll be interesting to see what we get out of the, um, the zero carbon bill. And government's role, of course, and this is really important, is the over that we want from government, we want overall policy coherence. So what we want to see is how all of those various parts of the puzzle fit together because they are incredibly com complex. And so we're wanting government to actually, and which is what this government is absolutely doing, signal ambition and provide um, leadership because, as I said, that will help catalyse um, greater effort by um, business. Um, and also, you know, we want cross greater cross-agency collaboration at ministerial and official level um, to drive strategically coherent change. And again, we're seeing that. Um, I guess ultimately there we want the government to also do a bit of practice, what it, practicing what it preaches um, around sustainable um, procurement. Um, actually, and while I've got the floor, I'll finish with a shameless plug um, for a summit that we're holding at the end of this month. Um, its theme is that of the three Ds, digitalisation, decarbonisation and decentralisation, and actually how these forces are at play in the energy transition that we're all a witness to. So if you're interested in coming along, grab me at the end. Thanks very much. I'll start with a plug. Don't forget, free book, <laughs> well being <laughs> Hi, I'm Caroline Saunders. Thank you very much for the invite. Um, up from Lincoln University down in the sunny South Island, although it was a bit misty this day. Um, cool. So um, I think I was brought here for the agricultural bit. So sorry, guys, if, you know, in Auckland, you know, agriculture bit. And I think one of the first things is agriculture is important. And um, so if you go to, to this slide that agriculture is 6.3 of GDP, if you add on the processing industries, it's 11.9. And then the other indirect industries, probably a lot of jobs in Auckland, you're getting up towards 20% of the economy. And then there's the allied, which would probably be in there, 25%. So you can't ignore it. Now, my dream is that we get win-wins. The agriculture, you talked about change of land use, it might be some land use practice. That we get past this culture of more milk, more grass, more cows, and churning the handle out, that we get higher value in market, for our agricultural products, and that's a lot of what my day job is, is finding out where are those premium segments in market we can get our paws on, because New Zealand should be high value, not low cost of anything, high environmental value, high social value, high cultural value, and get those values back to New Zealanders. And why aren't we out there, like when we were talking about the ETS 10 years ago, whenever it was, out there as saying we are the only country in the world that's got agriculture within some kind of carbon policy, and I'll say at the minute whether it's ETFs or not, and sell ourselves right in that thing. So thank you, 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 you fed right into that. So that's one little rant. Okay, so I thought I'd better look at something about, I knew about agriculture and energy use, which to be honest wasn't a lot, but you know, agriculture is about 4.8% um, of national consumption, but when you add the other stuff, it's up to around 30%. So again, reflecting the importance of agriculture and the economy. We've had an increase in energy consumption in New Zealand, so hoo -hoo, let's see about bringing that back down. But agriculture has increased by more and processing more than that. And we're really reflecting the increase in dairy that's gone on. Um, combined consumption of agriculture, so you've increased by 3%, but our export value has gone up a little bit more than that. Um, we can remember in agriculture and in, I don't see this in the debate much, it's not just the energy use of diesel, petrol or electricity, it's the, in agriculture it's the inputs, so fertiliser, pesticides, herbicides and all the other things that you use in agriculture, but again the embodied capital. And that's when we did the food miles report all those years ago, that was the big difference between us and the UK market. The other thing is that um, when we're looking at emissions, one thing that doesn't plan in our favour is it tends to exclude emissions from shipping and um, air freight, not that we do much air freight. Um, the elephant in the room, of course, as others have talked about, is agriculture is the big one for greenhouse gas emissions, with nitrous oxide 16%, methane 32%, and then you've got all the other little bits here. So here's the big elephant of the room, and thank God Amelia's here because she can explain to you in more detail than I ever could about um, the, the methane being a flow gas, not a stock gas. 
I did was reading about it and understood one then. So I was lucky enough to be on a committee set up by Jacinda, chaired by Peter Gluckman, looking at what was there, what could happen if we put agriculture into a lower carbon, you know, to reduce the emissions in agriculture. Um, and so, you know, the kind of thing that's come out, Gluckman's um, report's out there, you can get your paws on it, is he's actually moved away from agriculture coming under the ETS. I mean, I'm not saying it's where it's going to land. Um, there's some issues with agriculture and the um, emissions training scheme. One is, how the hell do you measure it? And in particular, if you're going to have a, me a measurement that has to stand up in court, because, of course, biological emissions by their nature are variable, and Overseer is a particular tool at the moment that good on it, but it was never designed for that, and there are issues around um, how they're measured. It's also a big issue around point of obligation. Um, they want a scheme in that incentivise farmers to do things, but to have the point of obligation at the farmer would be really tricky. So they're talking either processing companies and or some sector bodies might even do that. Um, the one that uh, Gluckman's come out with is farm management pan plans. Now, there are these environmental farm management plans that are being implemented across the country, particularly for the pastoral sector. And whether to incorporate the um, greenhouse gas reduction, emissions reduction in there with maybe a fine or something if they don't meet it. So another way of this being implement, implemented. Big debate about whether we include or exclude methane. I'm right with Amelia, we need to bring it down. But is it a separate gas? Is it a separate policy for that? Um, the billion trees being mentioned. And we've got the nitrate limits, um, the water nitrate limits. I'm concerned that we've got policies everywhere, like you said, and they're being developed in silos. We've not got the conversation across, neither at the farm level. I think a lot's going to matter about the rules of the game. What counts as a tree? Is it a shelter belt? Is it a small planting? Um, there's gossip at the moment. Well, it's not gossip. People on Banks Peninsula, that funny little bit that sticks out near Christchurch, um, are buying tracts of land to plant Pinus radiata in, and, the, and it's the last thing you probably want there. Or, you know, we, as you said, we need that debate um, about what we want where. And it staggered me how little a billion trees would go towards reducing our emissions profile and help us towards a carbon zero economy. So, win-wins though. Get out there, get more true value for what we do and everything from New Zealand should be high value, not low cost. Thank you.